everybody. Uh, we're back again for another Food History Happy Hour. My name is Sarah Wasbrook Johnson, also known as the Food Historian. Um, and it's kind of crappy out tonight. So we're going to need a little bit of a different cocktail. Hi, Marty. Um, so I have my trusty, dusty mug that says Ufta. <laughs> Uh, this is a gift from my friend Emily, so if she ever watches this, she will see her mug starring tonight. Sadly, I don't have any clear glass mugs, um, so you can see what we're going to make, but that's okay. So what's everybody doing tonight? Is it snowing where you are? <laughs> it's not snowing here in the Hudson Valley yet, but they're definitely predicting snow for the overnight. It has been raining all afternoon. Hi, Tiffany! Thanks for joining us. Yeah, if you're watching, feel free to say hi in the comments. Um, Cause otherwise I don't know that you're watching. So yeah, it's been a bit of a week for me. So I don't have a lot planned for tonight. I thought we'd talk a little bit about the cocktail and some of the history behind some of the ingredients. Uh, but other than that, I'm open for discussion. So if you have your questions, now is the time to start thinking about them. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started on my cocktail because it's a little chilly out here on my porch and I don't want um, my hot water to get cold. So tonight we are making a cocktail called Black Stripe. It's from the 1946 Roaming Bartender, which I have used before on the show. Um, it's a pretty simple recipe. It is hot water, which is staying warm under this towel here. <laughs> uh, molasses. And it calls for high proof rum, which I do not have. And presumably the high proof rum is spiced, which I also do not have. Um, but I thought I would use that other early American uh alcoholic beverage, moonshine. In particular, is it on that side? Yes. Apple pie moonshine I thought would go great with um, molasses and a hot toddy. So that's what I'm going to do. The recipe is very straightforward. Um, it calls for me to fill a hot beverage glass, in this case my Ufta mug, uh, three quarters of the way full with hot water, add a spoon of molasses, and one ounce of high proof rum, but because this is not high proof, um, this is only 70 proof, I'm probably just going to do an ounce and a half because, you know, I'm like that. So I also have my little North Dakota. <laughs> it's North Dakota night here on the food story. <laughs> my little North Dakota tell thanks from my mom. So... I'm going to follow the instructions. It says water first, then molasses, then alcohol. So that's how we're going to do it. So three quarters of the way full of hot water. Oh, yeah. Staying nice and hot. Yay. The towel worked. It says a spoon of molasses. So I just have a regular spoon. Uh, and we're not going to go too crazy with the molasses here. Oh, that looks cool. <laughs> Put that in there. And then, again, the original recipe calls for high proof rum, which I don't have. So I'm going to use apple pie spice um, moonshine. Funnily enough, I don't know if you guys can see it. Not really. There is a little uh, bit of cinnamon bark floating around in there, so that's kind of fun. All right, calls for an ounce, but because this is not high proof, I'm going to do an ounce and a half. Or thereabouts, a little bit less. So I don't want to spill. Not a very well cocktail tonight, you guys. Um, but a very American one, as I said, um, because of the molasses and calls for rum. I'm using moonshine. Oh my god. It smells amazing. Yep. Am I missing people's comments as per usual? I am. 
Sam. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. Hi, Jonelle. Hi, Vanessa. Brandy says it's chilly in Santa Fe, but no snow. Carla says hi. Yes, Jonelle, Emily got me this mug. I also love it. I don't have very many Scandinavian things in my house, sadly, despite being a super Scandinavian. Yeah, apple pie moonshine was a really good idea, you guys. It smells great. Okay, but now, like, it's hot enough that I'm afraid to drink. <laughs> so I'm just going to let it sit there for a minute. And uh, we could talk a little bit about molasses and rum. So molasses is what's left over. Basically, it's a byproduct of the sugar refining process. Um, I think I've mentioned here before that brown sugar, modern brown sugar is just white sugar with some molasses added back in. <laughs> Vanessa says it's snowing up where she is in the Mohawk Valley of New York. Uh, I think we're going to get there, which is why I chose a hot beverage for tonight. Um, so yeah, molasses byproduct of the sugar industry and rum is from made from molasses. So it's an alcohol that is distilled from molasses. So it makes sense that you would put the two together. Um, however, moonshine, this particular moonshine, you can make moonshine from anything, which a lot of people did. Moonshine is like poor people alcohol. <laughs> Um, but this particular moonshine is made from corn whiskey. So another very distinctly American alcohol. Okay. Is it, is it cool enough to drink? We'll find out. Hmm. That's interesting. Just kind of tastes like hot alcohol. <laughs> to be honest with you hot, watery alcohol. Uh, you get a little bit of a hint of the apple pie spice, which is nice. And the molasses is, you know, not super forward, but. Yeah, not my favorite, I have to say. I mean, it's not terrible. I'll drink the whole thing, but I would not make this again. Maybe it's better with rum. I don't know, but. <laughs> At least it's hot. At least it's hot because it's cold out. So I don't have anything planned for tonight, you guys. I have failed you. Um, we could talk about slavery if you want, because that's where sugar comes from in uh, North and largely South America, mostly from the Caribbean. Rum and molasses. Uh, <laughs> Marty says, that's a toddy. LOL, hot watery alcohol. <laughs> yes, it's just hot watery alcohol. Not not very exciting, sadly. Um, but yeah, rum and molasses is definitely part of the uh, triangle of trade in the Atlantic. Oh, Jerusha says fog is just rolling in here at Ferndale, California, near the ocean and the California Oregon border. Hot drink sounds good, I guess. I like coffee. I'm a bad Scandinavian Jersha. I hate coffee. What? I hate coffee. Carla says, maybe you need to be colder to appreciate it fully. Probably. I mean, if I was colder, I'd probably like it better if there was more alcohol in it. It's growing on me a little. Add more alcohol to make it more exciting. I don't, I don't actually want more alcohol in it. Wait, see, the problem is, is like, it's a little bit apple pie-ish. It's kind of molasses-y. It tastes sort of like, you know, a molasses, like a ginger snap, basically. But a sad, watery ginger snap. And I want it to be more sweet and like have butter or cream in it or something. <laughs> You know, it tastes like dessert, so it should actually taste like dessert, but it doesn't. That's all right, though. I'm not sure cream or butter would improve it, to be honest with you. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I can't say why it's called black stripe. It does taste, um, you know, molasses has kind of the little hint of minerally bitterness at the end. This is actually would probably make a pretty good coffee substitute. Yeah, if you like your coffee sweet, that is. 
Anyway, what are you guys up to tonight? Any burning food history questions for me? Because like I said, I didn't have anything prepared. I did post um, tonight about um, weird vegetables. We could talk about weird vegetables. <laughs> I did a uh, paper in undergrad on, I think I mentioned it before, Randolph Pumsfield. And he was really interested in mangelwurzels which are, I believe, a kind of rutabaga slash turnipy thing, um, also known as scarcity root. There's very little information on the internet about mangelwurzels, but he mentioned them frequently in his diary. Um, normally used as cattle fodder, but it's called scarcity root because they, they get really big and they grow well, apparently, in poor soil and bad weather conditions, so people would eat them in famine times. It's always surprising to me how many root vegetables that we think of as people food started out as cattle fodder, like carrots, for instance, uh, for a long time were considered cattle feed and not really fit for human consumption, um, depending on where you lived, obviously. But uh, in World War II, um, there was a concerted effort to make carrots more palatable to mainstream British people. And uh, part of that was to say that they were good for your eyes. They're not really that great for your eyes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, now we eat carrots all the time. Oh, thanks, Jerusha. Thanks for popping in. If anybody needs to leave, you can. Um, yes, I really enjoy rutabagas too. Um, also known as Swedes, and I'm Swedish, so maybe that's why I like them. Uh, a main component in Cornish pasties. Not a Cornish pasty if it doesn't have rutabaga in it. But, uh, yeah, they're golden and sweet. Kind of like a cross between a turnip and a carrot, I guess, in terms of flavor. Oh, Carla asks, how did Jerusalem artichokes get their name? <sighs> that's a good question. Let's ask the magic box. Um, so Jerusalem artichokes are also known as sunchokes. Um, oh, other names include sunroot and earth apple. Um, species of sunflower native to North America. Um, I don't know how they got their names. Interesting. But I didn't know that they were specific to North America because, of course, I'm pretty sure sunflowers are found elsewhere in the world. Definitely, I knew they were indigenous to North America, but. All right, we're looking. Um, Oh, Carla says, why the push for carrots? All right, well, while I'm looking this up, we'll talk about carrots shortly. So um, carrots are fairly sweet root vegetable, and they are a good source of vitamins. And it's one of the few um, vegetable crops that grows very well in British soil and conditions. So during World War II, when U-boat and submarine blockades prevented Britain from getting a lot of food imported, uh, they had to rely a lot on uh, their own indigenous foods, right? What they could raise themselves and carrots became uh, a big part of that. So like there was a lot of recipes for, um, you know, like mock marmalade that called for like carrots and lemon juice um, that was supposed to taste like orange or mock apricot jam that was made out of carrots. Lots of things made out of carrots. <laughs> Jerusha, I'm going to remind everybody from Jerusha, don't forget to call your mom on Sunday. Hi, mom. I'm planning to call you on Sunday. Don't worry. Neil loves carrots. I also love carrots. I can see why cows would enjoy them. Um, I really enjoy carrots with thyme, the herb. That's my favorite. Roasted with thyme is my favorite way to eat them. All right, we're looking at Jerusalem artichokes still. 
Aha! Jerusalem, the Jerusalem part of Jerusalem artichoke, I think I knew this, um, is probably, nobody knows for sure, but it probably comes from the Italian word for the plant, which is girasol or girasole, which is the Italian word for sunflower. So it's probably a bastardized version of that. Um, yeah. Oh, the other theory is that uh, Puritans thought they were creating a new Jerusalem. And so they found a Jerusalem artichoke and named it after that. I've never had Jerusalem artichoke. Um, a lot of historic vegetables that aren't really in widespread use anymore are not in widespread use anymore because they're very difficult to clean. So like salsify, Jerusalem artichoke. There's another root vegetable that was popular in the Middle Ages that I'm forgetting about, but it's got like a bajillion fingers, kind of like a carroty vegetable, but it's got a bajillion skinny little fingers. So it's difficult to clean and to work with. So nice fat root vegetables, <laughs> like potatoes and carrots are, are much easier to work with. Um, Carla asks, what is mock turtle? Um, it depends, but mock turtle, like most mock meats, is usually made out of veal, right? Veal is like the tofu of the meat world because it's bland and not very flavorful. And so you can kind of dress it up in a lot of different ways and pretend that it's other meat. So occasionally I have found run across mock turtle recipes that are vegetarian, but rarely. It's usually veal. Yep. Anybody have any other questions? Um, salsify, which I've also never had. <laughs> Only strange root vegetables that I need to track and eat. Um, salsify is also known as oyster plant because supposedly it tastes like oysters, um, which is probably another reason why I have not tracked it down because I don't like oysters. Neil says, boil that calf's head. Yeah, I'm pretty sure calf's heads uh, are another way that you can, like mock turtle soup. It's made from calf's heads. Yes, Carla, it was supposed to be actual turtle, also known as terrapin, uh, which is a sea turtle native to the mid-Atlantic, I believe. Um, hunted almost to extinction. Uh, I have never had it. They are still around. I th think you might be able to still eat them. I'm not super sure. Um, but yes, late Victorian era, uh, terrapin soup, mock turtle soup. And then of course the mock turtle soup, uh, were very popular kind of rich people food. So uh, ironically, I'm sure it didn't start out as rich people food. I'm sure it started out as like indigenous poor people, settler food. Uh, and then like most things in the Victorian era, uh, the late Victorians were obsessed with game meats, right? Duck, quail, pheasant, venison, boar, terrapin, all sorts of stuff. Um, again, I haven't had it because it's not really a common dish. Neil apparently has had it and says it's delicious. So I'll take his word for it. Oh, excuse me. It's growing on me. Neil also says that salsify does not taste like oysters. What does it taste like then, Neil? I'm so curious. I've had parsnips, also delicious. Um, sweeter, blander versions, version of carrots in my opinion. Um, they tend to be a little bit drier than modern carrots. Um, if you've ever had heirloom carrots, which I've also had, um, it, they tend to be, they tend to taste a little bit more like carrot top smell rather than modern carrots are very sweet and very mild. So Carla wants to know, did they buy the game from hunters or in a market? That's a good question. I think probably it started out as 
rich people hunting themselves, not terrapin, obviously, but, you know, game, bird game hunting. Um, the duck, uh, domesticated duck was a huge industry on Long Island. If anybody has ever been to Long Island and seen, I think there's, I don't know what town it is, but there's a giant duck statue. <laughs> Peking duck, I believe. Not Peking duck. What are they called? I have to Google it now. It's going to drive me crazy. Um, give me a second here. Uh, Neil says, the Brits like to eat their game very high, as in high taste. It is hung for some time, almost to rotting, and then cooked. Yes. Um, most people don't know, like, people who, maybe people who really like steak figure this out, but most steak is also hung. It's aged, right? Which means you just keep it in a cold place <laughs> and let it get old before you eat it. Um, and it starts to break down a little bit and get some extra flavor. So that's what Neil is talking about. Oh, it is a Pekin. Pekin, not Peking. Uh, the white Pekin duck, it was very popular on Long Island. So people did eat wild duck. Um, gosh, there's another term for it that's just completely escaping me. There were a couple different, um, breeds of wild duck that people ate. You'll see them occasionally listed like by the breed in the old menus and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think people were largely buying from market quite pheasant. Maybe depends. Um, you could get potted pheasant. That's another very British thing to pot foods means you, um, you cook them and then you seal them in fat. And that acts as a preservative. So if you keep it cool, the fat um, gets all the oxygen out. So it really slows the um, rotting process, I guess you want to call it. Um, oh, thank you, Neil. Neil, you should just do the show. <laughs> the giant duck is in Flanders, New York, which I assume is on Long Island. The giant white duck, if anybody's ever seen that. Good questions, though. Yeah. I mean, definitely good cold weather discussion. Root vegetables and game meats, right? But yes. Uh, mock turtle, city chicken. I think we've talked about this before. City chicken is veal. Yep. Most mock foods, <laughs> most mock meats are really made out of veal. And we've talked about this before because veal. It was incredibly plentiful, particularly in dairy industry areas. Oh, yes, pheasant, woodcock, and grouse. Neil has gone shooting in the UK. Wow. You're so much better traveled than I am, <laughs> Neil. You know, I've only ever read about shooting parties like in Regency novels and stuff. Parsnip chips. I have not had parsnip chips. I have, however, made a parsnip cake before with cooked mashed parsnip, kind of like a carrot cake. That was good. I put Chinese five spice powder in it, though. That was a little much. It kind of overwhelmed the parsnip flavor. Um, let's see. What other slightly defunct vegetables? Oh, one of my favorites, um, which is very difficult to find in grocery stores, is uh, kohlrabi. Depends on where you live, I guess. Um, so kohlrabi is a member of the brassica family. And, oh, Carla just posted the big duck in Flanders, New York, in the comments, if anybody wants to check it out. Um, so kohlrabi is, acts like a root vegetable, but isn't. It's um, like the bulbous stem, which is interesting. So it's kind of like broccoli stem, but if broccoli stem was like a big globe. Um, and it tastes like a cross between broccoli and a radish to me. It's very juicy when it's fresh and not too old. It gets kind of woody when they get old. Um, ironically, I've never had it cooked. I like it raw. So sliced raw with uh, salt and pepper is very good. So Neil says it's usually served with game. Who knew? I didn't know. 
I've only ever seen it in recipes. Um, it's usually creamed. It's a very Scandinavian thing. Finnish, Swedish kohlrabi. And uh, I don't know what other weird vegetables do you guys want to know about. I'm trying to think of some more. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Like I said, it's been kind of a long week. Um, Neil, how can I forget about celeriac? Also known as celery root. Um, ugliest thing. Big, novelly, scary looking thing. You have to cut quite a lot of it off um, so that you don't have the skin on it. Celery root is very delicious. Um, traditional way of preparing it in France is uh, celery remoulade. So you usually parboil it. Um, and uh, shred it or julienne it and then serve it um, in a remoulade, remoulade sauce. Uh, often you put lemon juice in the water because it does turn brown quite quickly. It's kind of like a reddish, sorry, wow, whitish green color. And uh, if you don't acidulate the water, um, it oxidizes in the air and turns brown, kind of like um, apple stew. Uh, I enjoy celery root and celery stalks together. Actually, I had a Caesar salad version that was um, julienne celery root and very thinly sliced celery with uh, Parmesan crumbles and an anchovy Caesar dressing with lemon, lots of lemon. Oh my God, it was so good. Um, I have tried to recreate it at home to little avail, but um, that was a very memorable meal. So yeah, celery root is also delicious. But these are things that are very hard to find in grocery stores these days, which is ironic because they're fairly easy to grow um, and fairly sturdy root vegetables for the most part. So if you see, see it, kohlrabi, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes, celeriac, um, celeriac, I never, 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 never know how to pronounce it, and my personal favorite, rutabaga. Uh, turnips are, you can still get, I'm not a huge turnip fan, they're a little bitter for me usually, because usually they aren't brought to market until they're way too big. If you can find baby turnips, definitely eat those. Um, radishes are still very common. I have some in my fridge, actually, that I need to eat to figure out what to do with them, but probably we'll just eat them with butter and salt like the French do. Anyway, what else is everybody up to tonight? It's not snowing yet, I don't think. But um, yes, Neil says you have to do the same with salsa. You have to acidulate the water, put it in acidulated water with lemon juice or vinegar, or it will turn black or brown. Yep. Why do we like to have our fruits be white? I don't know. I guess because it looks nicer, cleaner, who knows, but... Anyway, so yeah, trying to think of what else is going on in my life. Not a whole lot. Trying to get the book done. A bunch of you liked the um, my post about the reverse outline. Uh, maybe I'll post it. I'm almost done. I'm on chapter 10 of 12, which is pretty great. Yes. Elizabeth says, my boyfriend says a teacher salad is Mexican. It is technically Mexican. Well, I have to look it up. I don't know if it was invented in Mexico or by a Mexican immigrant. So we're going we're gonna to Google it now. You guys are making me ask the magic box a lot. Carla asked, what is acidulated water? Acidulated water is water that you've added an acid to. Usually um, lemon juice, but you can also use vinegar or citric acid. Yes. Okay. Citrus salad was invented in Mexico by an Italian immigrant. Okay. He was living in San Diego. It says Cesar Cardini, living in San Diego and working in Tijuana, where he avoided the restrictions of prohibition in the 1920s. What? Everything always comes back to prohibition. <laughs> Moonshine, Caesar salad. 
Who knew? Who knew? Yes, Neil says the book. Oh my gosh, you guys. I am like, so I've done this reverse outline thing, which is something that I came up with. So I started writing this book in 2015 and I finished my first draft of the manuscript in 2017. And then I didn't look at it really for like a year. <laughs> and um, I got peer review back. They said I needed more context and some of the chapters are very interesting, but um, they just needed some work. <laughs> and uh, so I was like been chipping away at it a little bit here and there, here and there. And I decided I really needed to get the whole book like in front of me, but in a way where I didn't have to read all 300 pages every time <laughs> I wanted to review like the organization of the book and am I answering all my arguments that I brought up and is it um, you know organized in a coherent way. So I started this thing called a reverse outline where I go for each chapter, I do an outline with like the chapter title and then each um, paragraph in the chapter, I like summarize in a couple of words so that I can see the flow of the argument and where I have gaps. And as I go, I'm like, oh, I haven't talked about this in this chapter or, oh, here's a gap that I need to address or, oh, I should have introduced this organization three chapters ago. <laughs> So when I'm done with that, then I have to actually go back and do all the work that I've told myself I need to do. So my goal is to have it done um, by the end of August at the latest. We'll see, because that's there's a editorial board meeting. I believe there's one in like September, January, and May. So, oh, Neil is coming up with all kinds of great vegetables to mention. Um, cardoons. You've never had a cardoon. It looks like a giant cross between celery and aloe vera stock. And um, it tastes like artichokes. And they're like kind of, they have kind of serrated edges, sort of like arch, um, aloe vera stocks do. Um, they're delicious. They're also Italian, I believe. Roman, perchance. Um, Usually not eaten raw. Yes, also known as the artichoke thistle, and it's related to globe artichokes, which is what everyone is familiar with. I have seen them occasionally in the grocery store. I have always been afraid to come. They're quite large, you know, they're big. Um, but I love artichokes and cooking globe artichokes always just seems like way too much effort. So yes, native to Western and Central Mediterranean region, domesticated in, in ancient times still occurs as a wild plant and its flowers look like giant purple thistles. So weird, like what plants are edible and what plants are not. Um, brassicas though, man. The Europeans, they just really, any way you could eat a brassica, we forget it all. all. All the way from mustard to broccoli. Ooh, yes, Liz brings up um, sun chokes, which are the same thing as Jerusalem artichokes, which we discussed a little bit earlier. But yes, the roots of a specific type of sunflower. Neil brings up fiddleheads, fiddlehead ferns. Uh, I believe the, gosh, which fern is it? Not every fern, you can eat the fiddleheads. And I don't want to tell you the wrong one. Yes, ostrich ferns. That's what I thought. Um, yes. So you can eat other fiddleheads, but uh, ostrich ferns are the most edible, I guess. I have had fiddleheads. I'm not a huge fan. Um, I don't know. They're kind of, they have a little bit of like a musty flavor in addition to the green, I think. Um, Neil also brings up samphire, which I think is a sea vegetable. I'm like, just want to make sure, you guys. That's why I keep Googling everything. Yes, 
Yeah, so of course Neil's gonna bring it up because it's British. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a it's a type of succulent plant that grows in rocky coastal areas. Um, often people made it into a type of salad, which I think was probably not that different from seaweed salad, but people in Asian countries develop. Neil brings up ramps. We talked about ramps last time. It's a type of wild onion um, that is being over harvested. So I've stopped eating them personally, but uh, they are delicious. Roasted, roasted ramps are so great, especially if you get the leaves a little bit crispy. Yep, they're awesome. Yeah, vegetables. Why don't people eat more vegetables, you guys? They're so good. And we've like, I mean, I guess people have kind of seen the light with tomatoes that they understand that there's more than like two varieties of tomatoes and that we should love and appreciate all the varieties of tomatoes equally. <laughs> but, and you know, they're kind of starting to get that way with potatoes, but we've lost a lot of um, species diversity with vegetables, which is why I'm so intrigued by heirloom vegetables. Um, Elizabeth brings up garlic scapes. Garlic scapes are a very good alternative to ramps. The flavor is not quite the same, um, but they're more sustainable and they look awesome because they're like these weird, long, curly, kiwi, alien looking things. They make very good pesto. Uh, and one of my friends, Ashley, pickles them. Neil brings up pokeweed. Yes, yeah, so this is actually a good time to talk about um, all the different kinds of wild greens that people used to eat that they don't really eat anymore. Because <laughs> um, it's a good time of year for that. So we're in May now. Um, so we're starting to get some garden crops, although not if it snows, right? But wild greens were very, I shouldn't say popular, but very necessary food stuff uh, for people in northern climates um, coming off of the winter because some of the first green vegetables that you can eat. So pokeweed, um, dandelion, chicory, uh, chickweed, um, if you enjoy wild greens, please eat garlic mustard. It's an invasive. I just pulled up like a giant bundle of flowering garlic mustard today and it's still everywhere in my woods. So get rid of it by eating it. Um, but all these kinds of greens, crazy greens, things like that. Um, people would harvest them wild in the springtime. A lot of people thought that they were like a tonic in the spring and that they would like thin your blood that had gotten too thick over the winter. Um, ooh, cowslips, Vanessa brings up, yeah. Um, so, and then of course the more cultivated varieties like sorrel, which is my favorite. If you've never had sorrel, it's awesome. It tastes lemony. Doesn't look that great when you cook it. It turns kind of an olive green, um, but it tastes fantastic. Put it in soup, you won't regret it. Um, but all of these greens were kind of some of the first fresh foods that people could get in the spring before their gardens um, started growing. So imagine, you know, you spent the whole winter eating. By the time you get to March, April, your cabbages are gone. Maybe most of your pickles are gone. You might be down to cornmeal or flour, potatoes, <laughs> whatever salted meats you've managed to put by. Um, so when the cows started producing milk, when the chickens started producing eggs again, uh, when you could go out and harvest wild greens and wild onions, that was like a huge change in your diet and a very welcome change for a lot of people. So you also get um, stuff like, if you ever heard of sassafras tea, a lot of other roots people would harvest in the spring when the ground thawed um, and drink these uh, often bitter tonics. And that was um, to help thin their blood, as they say. Yes, purslane, yeah. All kinds of, all kinds of greens, uh, a lot of which grow wild that we don't even think about anymore because we don't need to. But that, that brings up an interesting thing. So. Um, I'm thinking about, I don't know if anybody's read my little article that I wrote about the comparisons between World War One and the progressive era and today with what's going on with coronavirus and also just some of the other general similarities. 
I'm actually thinking about revamping it and submitting it somewhere, maybe the Atlantic, because now two separate people have told me I should do that, so I feel like maybe I should do it. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I talk about in my book is that some of the early food preservation um, and conservation uh, people, home economists, reformers, um, at the very start of World War I, of course, the United States entered World War I in April of 1917, and so People hadn't really planted their gardens yet, and they wanted to talk about food preservation. So one of the things that um, a home economist from Cornell University talked about on an instruction train was how to can dandelion greens. Um, and she has a recipe for a cold pasta salad with dandelion greens and what she calls poor man's dressing, which has um, very little oil in it. Um, so it's like a cooked dressing. So anyway, that recipe is going in my book. Um, but that was one of the things that they talked about was there were real concerns about food shortages, that there would be these impending food shortages, that there wasn't enough food to go around. So a lot of the emphasis uh, very early on was about harvesting wild foods that would otherwise go to waste and wild spring greens being one of them. So interesting little connection. Hopefully we won't get there. Hopefully our food supply will not uh, be as bad as all the people growing Victory Gardens think it's going to be. And thankfully, it'll be summertime, hopefully by the time that that happens. So I have not planted a Victory Garden. I have thought about planting um, some fresh herbs. I have a lot of wildlife in my yard, a lot. Uh, so vegetable gardens don't last very long. And um, eventually, I'd like to put in raised beds, but the fence possibly a top fence so that nothing can get in. Oh, uh, because man, all of my flowers have to be deer assistant. Pe people, the wildlife are eating my lilacs and my rhubarb. What? I have to protect my lilacs and my rhubarb. I had to spray the deer away all over my lilacs. I, hopefully they'll survive. They're pretty cut back. And Second year in a row that my rhubarb has gotten eaten, but I found an interesting trick. My rhubarb is very near a tamarack tree, um, which is a type of uh, coniferous tree that loses its pine needles in the winter and grows them back in the spring. And uh, this particular one likes to lose branches all the time. They're like these long kind of whippy branches. So I took a bunch of branches and I stuck them up around the... Uh, around the rhubarb so that if it's deer, which are eating it, which I'm pretty sure they are, they can't get their little faces down in there to eat it. And so far it's working. So we'll see. Planted that rhubarb like four years ago and I have not yet harvested any rhubarb <laughs> because of the stupid deer. So that's where I am. But I could definitely harvest. I have wild onions growing around and I have uh, way too much garlic mustard so I can harvest garlic mustard as well. Um, which is tastes like garlic. It smells like garlic. It's really interesting little vegetable, but it's also super invasive. So please rip it out if you don't eat it. All right. Any other questions? We've got like 15 minutes left. No? Is it snowing anywhere else? I'm trying to think of what else we could talk about. Oh, Neil said earlier there's uh, limited vegetable varieties due to genetic modification. That is partially true, um, both in terms of uh, lab genetic modification and also hybridization, um, which is done in the field, not in the lab. You're not tankering with genes on, you know, the gene level necessarily. You're just crossbreeding. Um, but that does tend to limit stuff. Most heirloom varieties are open pollinated, uh, which means that they have not been um, copyrighted or tra trademarked or, you know, they're not anybody's intellectual property necessarily. And you can save seed legally and they will crossbreed on their own. Um, you do have to be a little careful, especially with some heirloom corn varieties because corn is wind pollinated. And uh, if you grow your heirloom corn near a field of conventional corn, you could contaminate your heirloom corn with, you know, another strain. Um, 
Oh, Elizabeth says they have the Heritage Grain movement now. Yes, that's one of my favorites. Um, I love whole grains. Um, I particularly enjoy spelt flour. Spelt is a type of ancient wheat. Um, some people who are sensitive to gluten can eat spelt and other ancient grains because um, they're less glutinous. Um, not everybody, though, obviously, but spelt is very sweet, nutty uh, wheat. I really enjoy it. I like it better than whole wheat, and I often will doctor um, whatever baked good I'm making with some spelt. I also enjoy rye. Rye was a very important crop in early America because it grew so much better in New England than wheat did. Much hardier, easier to grow. That's why a lot of northern European countries also rely on rye. Um, and barley. Barley is another good, very sweet, um, you know, kind of nutty uh, grain. But um, my personal favorite for cooking whole grains is a pearled farro. Farro is another very ancient grain. It's very popular in uh, Italy. And I like it, again, very sweet and nutty. I don't like some more bitter grains. Like, I'm not a huge fan of... Um, Kasha, which is a type of toasted whole buckwheat groats, um, a little better for me. I do like buckwheat pancakes. Who doesn't? <laughs> um, barley is good for sorghum, too, like sorghum syrup. I thought sorghum was its own grain. Or is that a type of dish, Elizabeth? I'm not sure. Hi, Glenn. Glad you could join us having finished work. Um, yeah, so one of the things I'm... You know, people have been asking me a lot, like, what do you think is going to happen to our food industry because of coronavirus? Um, and one of the things that I hope happens is a decentralization of food processing, including uh, grain milling. I would like to see that. I went to the grocery store today. No flour. I'm almost out of flour. <laughs> I'm going to make pancakes tomorrow like I usually do on Saturdays. And uh, then, I don't know, I might have one more batch of pancakes after that, and then we'll see. Um, but, yes, I'm definitely stretching with, with my whole grain stash whenever I can, although I used up the rest of my spelt flour the other day. Um, Carla asks, where can you buy these grains? Uh, so the flowers, um, Bob's Red Mill has a lot of um, historic and ancient grain flowers which you can get in a lot of grocery stores. They're not that cheap. Um, if you have a natural food uh, store or a co-op anywhere near you, often they will be able to get them in bulk. Um, that's where I get a lot of my whole grain stuff is the co-op where my mother-in-law lives. It's a fantastic place. Um, oh, Glenn says, shop right up here. I started getting flour, but still no use. Yeah, no use. Uh, Anna Catherine, I'll have to dig it up. Anna Catherine, um, one of my patrons, posted an article not too long ago about how you can't hurry up yeast production because yeast is just going to develop on its own schedule. Uh, I have seen a couple of posts on some of the recipe groups I follow of people purchasing brewer's yeast to bake with because it is very similar. And, in fact, that's how the first commercial yeast came about these connections to alcohol in the United States uh, was the first commercially available um, yeast came from brewing yeast, right? Yeast cakes, a moist yeast. Um, but yeah, so people are going back to that now. But yeah, I hope we get some decentralized food production. Oh, Neil has shared a link to, oh, nice. Fantastic. Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Castle Valley Mill, Stone Ground, Flowers Meals, Clean Whole Berry Grains, Grain Mixes. Nice. No, talk about decentralized food processing. <laughs> yeah, because Bob's Red Mill, I'm pretty sure, is in uh, Washington State. It's on the West Coast. Um, so, yeah, we, also, we already have a somewhat decentralized dairy production in this country simply because difficult to ship dairy super far, um, but uh, it's less decentralized than it used to be. Um, 
There used to be dairy and cheese factories, tiny factories, basically, uh, in just about every region of every state. That doesn't exist anymore. Flour mills used to be a lot more local. Um, eventually, I'm going to write an article and or book about um, community canneries and community meat lockers, which is something my grandmother grew up with both of those things in her small town, which also had a cheese factory and a dairy. Because <laughs> um, I think that that's really cool and we should bring that back. Um, yeah. There's already been, I think I talked about this last time, that there's been some um, progress in mobile abattoirs, um, slaughterhouses basically, uh, but it's pretty small scale and it's not really up to the task of the level of meat that we eat in this country, but with giant slaughterhouses um, shutting down because so many of the workers are infected with the coronavirus because there's just no social distancing possible, because uh, they're huge factories, maybe it's time to look at a different model where we have maybe not everything so huge all the time. Huge and centralized, because that's part of the problem with um, meat production in general. Everything is huge and centralized, which means that any kind of disease, whether it's through the animals or through the workers, spreads pretty quickly, uh, which is also why we use so many antibiotics in our meat industry, not only because they promote growth, uh, but also because they are kind of used therapeutically to prevent the spread of disease. Um, but they also promote antibiotic resistance in humans, potentially. So is that a trade-off we really want? I'm not sure. Uh, Neil brings up stanneries. Oh my gosh, yes. So. Um, in my cookbook talk into the other night, which, by the way, if you missed it, you should join me again on May 19th for Cooking by the Book. Um, but I talk about Cincinnati being Porkopolis. So in the 1840s, Cincinnati, Ohio was a huge meatpacking, you know, center uh, for pork. And um, a lot of soap and candle companies also grew up in that area, and I believe my mom said, because my mom lived in Cincinnati for a while. Just looking it up. Pretty sure Unilever started in Cincinnati. Um, because of the meat packing industry. Just double checking that. Or maybe it was Procter & Gamble. One of the two. Anyway, but yes, Neil brings up tanneries. Tanneries are another part of the slaughter industry. And historically, they were disgusting. Uh, here in the Hudson Valley, um, yes, thank you, Neil, Procter & Gamble. Um, here in the Hudson Valley, uh, tanneries needed tamarack. Not tamarack. Is it tamarack bark? Oh my gosh, you guys, my brain is just not working today. Uh, this is going to drive me crazy. Somebody tell me. Somebody, Carly, you know this. What's the tree? Tree in the Catskills? Hemlock. Is it hemlock? Hemlock. I'm pretty sure it's hemlock. Hemlock trees and the Haskells are totally denuded because the hemlock bark produces tannic acid, which you need um, to tan leather, which is why they're called tanneries. But then, of course, you have these huge vats of highly tannic water that they would just dump in waterways, which is really bad. Um, and they smell because it's leather. Guess what leather is before it turns into leather? Animal hides, right? Anyway, why do we always talk about horrible things, you guys? <laughs> because that's what history does, I guess. But yeah, candle and soap making industries, byproducts of slaughterhouses. Because, of course, candles and soap need fat. And where is a, you know, 
good source of fat is wherever you're slaughtering animals. So, yep, yep. Anyway, we got five minutes left, people. What are we going to talk about? For those of you who missed the cocktail in my Ufta mug, we did a hot toddy tonight called a black stripe. Calls for hot water, a spoon of molasses. And an ounce of hyper from. I did not have hyper from, so I used an ounce and a half of apple pie moonshine. Thank you, Glenn. So it's hemlock. Yes, it was hemlock. Tell you what, you guys, I'm having a hard time concentrating lately. This is part of the reason why I think the book is so hard for me right now because, like, finding the bandwidth <laughs> to really focus on the research has been very difficult for me lately. But we're going to do it, we're going to power through. I will not be making a hot toddy to get me there, though. It's, like, not terrible. It's cold. We'll warm it up a little bit. <laughs> Neil says slaughterhouses use all the bits up, everything but the oink. Yes, that's a very, that's an old saying. Uh, anybody who is a Laura Ingalls Wilder fan, they talk about that. I believe it's in Farmer Boy. Um, maybe it's in Little House in the Big Woods. I don't remember. But, uh, yes, they even ate the tail. Cut the tail off, put it on a stick, roasted. Yep, a lot of waste in modern slaughterhouses. Or maybe not, maybe it all becomes pink slime. Oh, yes, Glenn brings up that all the hemlocks that have grown back are being eaten up by Asian bugs. Yes, introduced species with no natural predators often quickly become invasive species and can do a lot of damage. Carla corrects me, it's from Little House in the Big Woods where they butcher the hog, thank you, I couldn't remember. I have to say, um, even though she can be a little bit problematic at times, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder is probably a big reason why I'm so interested in food history my favorite Laura Ingalls Wilder book is Farmer Boy because it's full of descriptions of food, right? And I don't know if Ashley is watching tonight, but my friend Ashley is distant, really, distantly related to Pa Ingalls because she's originally from Cuba, New York, which is around where Pa is from. Um, but yes, Farmer Boy, big influence on my life. Farmer Boy convinced me like, when I first read it when I was a kid, I thought apples and onions was, like, the most disgusting sounding thing ever. And then as an adult, I tried it, and it's delicious. So, yep. Yep. Big influence. Yes, Carla notes also that in Little House of the Big Woods, they make a balloon, a ball from the bladder of the pig. And they play with it. I remember that, too. Yep. Maybe that's not why, why I'm not so squeamish about it about meat like some people are who is it talking with about that like because our meat is uh so pre-packaged people are totally divorced from the fact that meat used to be alive and had like feet and wings or legs and heads and eyes and people get really squicked out by that and i'm like well if you can't handle the feet and the head maybe you shouldn't eat the meat that's all I'm saying. Vegetables are also delicious. You could be eating more vegetables. Yes, Glenn asked, was the farmer boy that had the bit about growing the milk pumpkin? Yes, I think it is. And they, like, fed the pumpkin milk. Giant vegetable growing is, like, its own mysterious art that I will never understand. Neil, <laughs> Neil says, ufta, ufta. Are we squicking you out, Neil, with all the discussions of feet and legs? We shouldn't. Ain't it such a historian? All right, friends. We have a minute left. Oh, the rambling journey that we always take. <laughs> Food history happy hour. Well, I think maybe we'll be done for the night. So thank you so much, everybody who joined me and for asking such good questions. We talked about greens and slaughterhouses and prohibition and alcohol and heirloom vegetables and all kinds of other fun stuff. Um, 
And this is week seven, which is kind of crazy to think about that it's been seven weeks since I started doing this. Um, but we're going to keep going indefinitely. And I'll try to be a little bit more prepared <laughs> next time with the topic to discuss. Um, so thanks again for watching. Uh, I'm Sarah Wasper Johnson, the food historian. This has been the Food History Happy Hour, and we will see you next week at 8 o'clock. All right? Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.